Picture the scene in 1997. I was 7 years old when my father introduced me to the Sony PlayStation. The first game he showed me was the original Tomb Raider. If you couldn't tell from my nearly hour long love letter that is my previous video, I freaking loved that game and I still do. It's probably the most important game of my childhood. After all, it was such a huge step forward from the old 16-bit games on the Mega Drive I was used to. Like I said in the last video, me and my mother moved to Germany in the mid 90s so I could only visit my father 3 times a year. Those were the only times I could play PlayStation because we didn't have one in Germany. When I got there he had always bought new PlayStation games and it felt like Christmas every time. I remember getting a letter or a postcard in 1998. In it my dad wrote that he had bought Tomb Raider 2. <laughs> Tomb Raider 2? There's a sequel? Without the internet or access to gaming magazines there was no way for me to know that. Indeed Tomb Raider 2 was released in 1997 for the PlayStation and PC just one year after the original. Whereas the first game simply stated featuring Lara Croft at the bottom of the cover, now it says starring Lara Croft right under the title. After all, Lara was a household name by this point. I was so thrilled and counted the days until I could play it. I had never been this excited for a new game before. In the summer of 98 I was finally able to play it and it was better than I ever imagined. Like before I wasn't very good at the game and would mostly watch my dad play. It was more thrilling than watching a movie. In 2011 I reviewed the game and to this day it's my second most watched episode. Next year is the 25th anniversary of Tomb Raider 2. So once again I want to answer a few questions. Has this game aged well? Did it improve on the first game and is it still playable today? Let's see what Lara Croft's second game has in store for us. Just like in the first game, we have the option to visit Lara's home before we start the adventure. Welcome back. The first thing you'll notice besides Lara's improved polygons is that this time around it's not limited to the mansion itself. In fact, we start outside. I decided to build this assault course. This acts as a replacement for the gym. Like before, Lara explains some of her moves. That's especially useful for the new ones. And by new ones, I mean the single new one. Somewhere between the events of Tomb Raider 1 and 2, Lara learned how to climb ladders. It's a fairly slow mechanic, but it'll come in handy later. There's even a zip line we can ride. On. Depending on how long you take to finish the course, Lara will say something different. Gosh, that was my best time yet. It's a nice touch. It teaches new players the game mechanics and veterans can show what they got. I'm Just don't touch the jam. floor. Back to the start, back to the start, back to the start. So what now? Feel free to explore the rest of the house and gardens. Alrighty then. If you haven't noticed, Winston, our trusty 500 year old butler, follows us around wherever we go and that seriously is the best part about the whole thing. The noises he makes are hilarious and sometimes he even breaks wind. There's a lady in the room, mister. The boxes in the main hall are gone and there are many old and new areas to explore. Sadly, there isn't much to do here. The library and music room are pretty much empty, just like the attic. The bedroom is a little more interesting because from here we have access to the bathroom. There's a keyhole next to this mysterious door, but the key doesn't exist and the door can't be opened. Pure trickery at its finest. As a kid I was searching for that damn key forever and I'd like to get my time back. Down where the gym was we have a big empty room with speakers. Push this button and we get to hear a sweet classical piece of music. Come on Winston, let's dance! Winston, dance, or I'll lock you in the freezer again. You left me no choice. Everyone who has played this game has done this. Gotta say, it still makes me smile when I see his face glitching through the door. Man, that's a kick-ass stereo you got there, Lara. Even outside you can still hear it clear as day. Lara even has a labyrinth in her garden and with patience we discover a secret passage to a button. Pushing it opens a timed door in the mansion. Now we have to make it back. Time is tight, so don't make any mistakes. With Lara's improved controls, turning is a lot easier. And would you look at that? In the cellar, Lara has stashed all of her gold and treasure. God damn, she's rich. She even brought home the cat from Egypt. All in all, this is one of the best tutorials ever. It's such a step up from the first game and there's so much to see. 
Granted, most areas are pretty empty, but with the Assault Cores, Secret Door and Winston, there's enough to keep you busy for a while. But now, on to the main adventure. This game is all about the hunt for the Dagger of Xion, however you pronounce that. Whoever plunges this dagger into his heart turns into a dragon. In ancient China, the emperor did just that. Tibetan monks were able to pull it out of his heart, killing him in the process. They brought the mighty weapon back to its resting place at a temple near the Great Wall of China, where it has rested for centuries. Naturally, our favorite adventurer Lara Croft needs to know if it really exists, so she makes her way to the Great Wall. That opening cutscene blew me away back then. I mean, we have a dragon, creepy music and demonic sound effects. Even the title screen is mysterious. Who is this guy with the black hat and what's up with that symbol? It shows us right away that this game means business. The Great Wall is the first level and Lara drops down into a cave. Not only do we have dual pistols with infinite ammo, but also a shotgun. Sweet! We see the helicopter that brought us here flying away. In a matter of seconds we hear a tiger that we can shoot from up here if we don't want to face it directly. Nearby we find our very first secret. Uh -huh. Whereas the number of secrets per level was random in Tomb Raider 1, here there are always three. This time you don't get weapons or medicine but silver, jade and gold dragons. Finding all three within a level rewards you with a bunch of goodies. After a couple of climbing and jumping exercises we're actually on the Great Wall where we get attacked by ravens. Down in the water we find a key and face another tiger. They are pretty fast so try to keep your distance. With a key we open a door to a room with spiders. Fucking spiders? They pretty much explode with one shot so they're more of a nuisance than a threat. Our favorite activity from the first game returns. Pushing and pulling blocks. It's not as slow as before, but still, it makes me groan. In the room with the flying blades, you can just shimmy along the side. So far we've been eased into the game, but now it's time to test your skills. Run over the broken tiles with spikes under them. Make sure the two boulders don't crush you. Jump over the spikes, escape the room with the spiked walls, sprint over even more broken tiles, jump over the blades and run like there's no tomorrow to avoid more spike walls. Damn, that was intense. Tense. It's like an endurance round with one hazard after the other and death around every corner. For beginners, this is a rough awakening and maybe too difficult, especially if you're going for the Jade Dragon. For me, it's seriously one of the most exciting parts of the entire game. And so early on, crazy stuff. After taking a couple of deep breaths, we make our way past two rolling blades. Our first instinct tells us that we have to use the zip line to cross the wide gap. Instead, make your way down to the bottom of the cave. The game wants us to climb down the ladder, but I prefer to tap the X button so that she lets go and holds onto it repeatedly. Saves a lot of time. On our way there we find flares. This game has some very dark areas, so collecting these is pretty much essential. We enter a dark green area with skeletons on the floor accompanied by unsettling music. We go deeper and holy mother of baby Jesus twin brother's cousin, a goddamn T-Rex in the first level! That thing sounds hungry. Hide in the passageway and pick up the third secret to receive the grenade launcher. What a powerful reward so early in the game. I'm not using it yet. From here we can shoot the T-Rex. Two T-Rexes? Two big ass dinosaurs in the first level. Wow. The assumption that most players probably missed this part entirely makes it even more thrilling. Less thrilling is the fact that we have to climb up again. This takes ages and all we have for entertainment is Lara's constant moaning. Now we use the zip line. Ah, spiders! There's this door we saw in the opening with that weird symbol. Walk towards it and finish the level. A cutscene shows Lara being ambushed by some random guy, but she manages to throw him off. She holds him at gunpoint to get some information about the door. Waiting for the right one. The right time to arrive. The right time to arrive. God, that cutscene brings back so many memories. Please go on. So unless you pledge your loyalty as well to the sins and fortunes of Marco Bartoli. Who is this Marco Bartoli guy he was talking about? On his laptop she discovers a clue that leads her to Venice. Aha. Uh -huh. Gianni Bartelli, Via Caravelli, Venice. The Great Wall is arguably one of the best first levels of all time. It is surprisingly difficult, but oh so satisfying. 
I mean, how can you top a trap marathon and double dinosaur action? By the way, you can turn around when you do a backflip in this game. Nice! In Venice, we get attacked by a Doberman. Not only that, there's a sniper on the balcony and around the corner is a club-wielding dude with his dog. So gone are the days where we only see a handful of human enemies throughout the adventure. In the boathouse we see a speedboat, but we need a key to actually drive away with it. Shooting windows is always a delight. I love the sound. We can actually walk on these awnings. One of the masked thugs has new weapons for us. Dual automatic pistols. More on them later. With the key in our possession we can take off with the boat. It's the first time in the series we can use a vehicle. Lara rode a motorcycle in some cutscenes in the first game, but that doesn't count. With the boat we drive through a dark tunnel with a waterfall. Without flares you can't see shit here. Some rats come out, but they aren't nearly as big and disgusting as they were in the prequel. Here we have to race the water to reach the next area with our speedboat. Now we enter the canals, which is pretty much the heart of this level. It's easy to get lost here because a Essentially, it's a big labyrinth with no clear signs of where to go, so it's up to us to explore the area. During this part, the classical music from the training level plays, and it's a perfect fit to this very light-hearted atmosphere. It's quite unusual if you really think about it. I mean, we can see a blue sky. A blue sky in a Tomb Raider game. 2 out of 10, this game sucks, not enough black. Actually, I think it's a nice change of pace. Anyway, there are many optional areas to check out and we can even destroy the gondolas. Lara doesn't give a crap about other people's possessions. You can jump off the boat and let it crash into the mines that are in front of the exit. The game is kind enough to provide us with another boat nearby. There are several ways to get there, but the most badass way has us crashing through windows. If you don't care about exploration, you can skip most of it. Just get to the button and swim to the exit with no fuss. It's the way I used to do it as a kid, but that's no fun for me anymore. Venice is a fun level with great boat action and vibrant scenery. The only thing I don't care for is the amount of human enemies we face, but that's something we have to get used to. In Bartoli's hideout, we abandon our boat after just a few seconds. Inside his villa, a bunch of masked goons wait for us. It is here that I used my first medipack. In this game, you are much more dependent on them because it's hard to avoid gunfire. Getting past the mechanical guards isn't too demanding, unless you run straight into the blade like me. Often when you climb a ladder, the same tune starts playing. Climbing sideways is so slow and boring. This is one weird ass mansion. Most rooms are just empty. In the fireplace is a movable block. Amazing how she just pushes a whole bunch of stone bricks like they are hollow. Hulk Lara returns. Here is the first time I saved within a level. You can save anywhere, unlike the first game with its blue save crystals. You could argue that it takes away some of the tension. I say it prevents a whole lot of frustration and saves time. Plus on the PlayStation not too many games let you save at your leisure. Consider me a fan. I saved because of some blades and flame traps ahead. As we see it was a wise choice. I died three very stupid deaths here. Here we can test the automatic pistols. They pretty much replaced the magnums. That's too bad. I loved the magnums. These weapons still do the trick. They just don't sound as heavy and powerful. The ballroom is my favorite part of the level. We have to climb onto the chandeliers and later change their heights. We get to hear a pretty sweet reimagining of the title theme. Behind a portrait we find a key and then we can drop down the chimney. Down, down, down the chimney. With the key we enter the library and climb up the bookshelves. Outside in a rather hidden spot we find some kick-ass weapons from the first game. Dual Uzis. In Tomb Raider 1 we got the fourth and final weapon as late as stage 12. Now we're only in stage 3 and already have 5 weapons. With a detonator key we picked up earlier we can blow up the abandoned house. Or at least that's what's supposed to happen. Hello? I think I broke the game. We saw the explosion, but the building is still the same. Maybe I didn't stand in the right position. Would you look at that? Just because I didn't trigger the sniper on the balcony, the game didn't change the appearance of the building. That's weird. Oh my god, that was so stupid. Where did I save? Yeah, that's a question I'm always asking myself. I'm notorious for forgetting it. Back then, my dad would always keep telling me to save. I kept getting cocky, so I didn't feel like it. Then, sure enough, I died and had to replay large chunks of a level. I told you to save. Yeah, yeah. I hate to admit when I'm wrong.
Bartoli's hideout is a delight. Of course it's a far cry from the tombs and caves from the past, but we have great puzzles, dangerous traps and once again a rather friendly vibe which I dig. Out of the Italy levels I like this one the most. When we played this game in 98, there were two levels in particular that gave us serious trouble because they were so complicated. Oprah House is the first one. It starts simple enough if you don't fall to your death like I did here. Once we leave that first area, we get to this part. The music tells us something is wrong here. We have to jump and run across the collapsing decaying roof, testing our platforming skills once again. The next open area is full of bad guys and dogs. Be sure to move around and jump when they shoot at you or else you're dog food. From here we get to the lighting booth that has a dark room below it. Here we encounter... Boulders? What? I thought this was an Oprah house, not a fucking mountain. Now we're in the main area. This part has several floors and many doors, some of which we can't access yet. It is filled with enemies and cheap traps. In case you don't want to waste flares, you can also use your pistols to light up the immediate area. I usually don't do that because I don't want to ruin my statistics. Stop barking! I have played this game many times over the years and every time I stand here and wonder what I'm supposed to do next. One room makes us solve a boring block puzzle. The ventilation ducts are a highlight for me because it feels so different. Don't you think shooting at helpless little rats is a little overkill, Lara? This place is fucked. Parts of the house are flooded, sandbags fall from the ceiling and there is broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the stairs, you know they just don't care. After running back and forth for 100 hours, finding keys, a relay box and a circuit board, we enter the final room. Here a guy with two big pistols is waiting for us. He is so strong, not even the grenade launcher will take him down immediately. Is he the goddamn Terminator? After all that crap, we enter a seaplane and trigger a cutscene. This weird symbol is everywhere! Lara overhears Marco Bartoli and his pilot Fabio talking about a seraph that they are searching for. We are searching the right place. I know it. I believe it, Marco. Suddenly, a guy knocks her unconscious. Well, shit. Oprah House is a little too complex for my taste. I don't dislike it as much as I used to, but I can't really say it's grown on me. Took me almost 80 minutes to finish it. Overall, the Italy levels are a change of pace from what we're used to, but it doesn't feel off. If anything, the first two are a breath of fresh air and even an opera house can have the same suspenseful feeling as a tomb. A cutscene shows the seaplane landing near an oil rig surrounded by ocean. In offshore rig, Lara wakes up on the floor and it seems we're imprisoned. Even worse is that all of our weapons are gone. Oh no, is this Natlas Mines 2.0? That was fairly late in the game, this is not. They were generous enough to let us keep everything else, including ammo. Even grenades. Which we can't use without the grenade launcher. Damn it! It's an easy escape. Move a couple of blocks, pull a switch and run through their timed door. An alarm goes off and... Boy, that sound gives me ear cancer. And it doesn't stop. We have to open a hatch under the plane. Inside we turn the propeller off so that we can jump onto the wing. Try to avoid the two bad guys as we have no way of defending ourselves. In the plane we find our good old dual pistols. Time for vengeance. Do you hear that? Silence. No more alarm. I'm free! Most goons are nice enough to leave ammo or health. How chivalrous. On the bunks we find not one, but two weapons. First the automatic pistols and then a harpoon gun. That's new. Oh, come on, really? Good thing I just saved. At one point we reach the top of the tower. Nice weather. I was blinded by the sun, I swear. No! What have I done to deserve this cruel punishment? Ah oh, yeah, right. Maybe I do deserve eternal suffering. But for real though, was this necessary? Makes me want to mute the TV. Here we have to pump water from one pool to another. The most memorable part is this huge room with a bunch of catwalks and water below. Do you hear that? Sounds like someone breathing. A little creepy. 
Turns out it's a diver who's shooting at us with harpoons. Best to shoot him from above. One guy has our shotgun and getting all secrets rewards us with the Uzis. So now the only weapon we haven't gotten back is the grenade launcher. Overall offshore rig is not the most exciting level in the world. I like the setting but it's a little forgettable. You're not without weapons for long which might be a missed opportunity. I would have liked to see her outsmart the enemies without her pistols. Diving area picks up where we left off. At the beginning we have to turn off a giant underwater fan. Like most levels before it, it's full of people out to kill us. Just like this harmless looking green pool. Who would have thought this was toxic waste? I didn't see a warning sign. Climbing to the ladder tune. How big is this fucking ladder? This is worse than pushing blocks. Jesus Christ, it takes over a minute. In a large, mostly empty room, we find a blue card and then... Back at the same ladder? One minute of my precious time clearly wasn't enough. This room is more interesting. We have a square hallway with the doors to the center room being locked. Here we get ambushed by four dogs and something I didn't see and killed off screen. Just some dude. Is that a flamethrower? Alarm! 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 After slaughtering more people, we see a helicopter take off. The burners are timed, but it's pretty easy to get past them. In the pit, we find a new weapon, an M16 rifle. We'll use it later. Speaking of fire, here's a flamethrower guy in action. Unless there's water nearby, you're as good as dead. This is another level of running around in lengthy underwater sections. There's even a submarine that's just sitting there. The goal is to turn off this circular saw because it's impossible to get the red card while it's still spinning. Trust me, I tried. Near the end we hear someone being tortured and interrogated by Marco Bartoli and someone else. We kill two guys and get to see another cutscene. Lara talks to a wounded monk. He explains that his father once bombed the vessel of Bartoli's father deep into the water. Lara changes into a wetsuit. Hey, be careful, this man is in enough pain. Marco shows up and shoots the monk. Lara escapes and follows the submarine. You know, I never really thought about it, but with the exception of one more sentence, this is the last line of dialogue we hear in the entire game. Considering we've only beaten a third so far, I find that rather odd. I like this level better than Offshore Rig. Even though the industrial setting is a tad bland at times, I enjoy the level structure and underwater parts. Still, I'm kind of glad there are only two oil rig levels. Lara holds on to the submarine surrounded by sharks. The pilot tries to get rid of her, but he should have paid more attention to what's ahead of him. Moron. I bet he'd get along with the captain of the Titanic. The sub crashes into rocks and this leaves Lara stranded in the ocean. Now I have one question. What the hell was your grand plan here, Lara? You know you have to breathe at some point, right? No. That really baffles my mind. I can accept that she's capable of a lot of things normal human beings wouldn't, but this was just suicidal. How are we going to survive this? 40 Fathoms has us diving in the middle of the ocean with no way of getting to the surface. It's very dark and some bloodthirsty sharks look at us like we're some nice meal. The area is quite large and it's easy to get lost. Back then on our old TV we couldn't see shit and it was thalassophobic as hell. The word thalassophobia refers to a fear of the ocean or other large deep bodies of water. Anyway, once we know what to do it's easy. Just follow the trail of scraps until we get to a sunken ship. A shark is tailing us. Don't shoot it or you might run out of air. Keep swimming until you finally get some sweet oxygen. The background noises with the heartbeat and stuff are intense. This is a sunken ship, but it's still crawling with bad guys. This guy looks like Popeye with a serious drug problem. One secret has a swimming past a shark and three barracudas. Not scary at all. I like that we can see them through the bull's eyes. Similar to City of Kamun, here we have to open a trap door to make dirt fall into a lower room. That's how we get out of here. The divers are annoying, especially when I can't shoot them from above. Even worse are the guys with the shotguns. They do a lot of damage. This is a rather short level. As a kid I was scared and couldn't go through with it. Today I don't mind it. It's not a level I would call fun or particularly intriguing, but the atmosphere in the beginning make it memorable. 
Wreck of the Maria Doria is another complicated level. I'm going to hear the breathing noises of the divers in my sleep soon. The echoes from caves are back. Nice. The set pieces here are incredible because the Maria Doria is upside down. That makes for some cool visuals. It's not always clear what you have to do. Even on this playthrough I didn't know where to go at some point because I had looked in every corner and was still missing one of the circuit breakers. Turns out it was there in plain sight all along. Can't really blame the game here. I'm too impatient or blind sometimes. But I can blame the game for its obsession with blocks. Come up with something different. Please. Now this is more like it. Breakable tiles combined with rolling barrels. That was close. In the room with the little boat, we have to somehow lower the water. Watch out for this trap door. At first I thought I was stuck here, but if we keep jumping, the door closes after a while. I always liked this large room with the broken glass in the middle. The blue tones give it a distinct look. The best part of this level is at the ship's bridge. It's so dark here and that can make for some scary moments. I did not see this guy coming. The camera shows us what's outside in the water. Do we have to swim there? Unfortunately, yes. Oh shit, they got me. Better get out of here. Nice. The third secret gave us the grenade launcher back. So now we have every weapon in the game. That's seven weapons in total. The level ends with an upside down glass ceiling and an underwater tunnel. The yellow eels can't be killed, so just swim past them. Although I spent about 70 aggravating minutes looking for the way ahead, this stage is still remarkable. It's such a unique setting that sticks out in the grand scheme of things. For me, Living Quarters was always the most forgettable stage in the entire game. Let's see if that's still the case. Again, it starts on the water and there's not much time. Find a switch to open a trap door. In the engine room we have to change the height of the pillars. Before we can do that there are rolling barrels to avoid and ugly bastards to kill. Shimmy past the fire, jump across the pillars and push more blocks. This level goes a little overboard with the blocks again. With the burner room flooded we can progress. What the hell was that? That is one creepy eel. Like the yellow ones, this beast can't be killed. Shit, I didn't get enough air. Poor Lara has to suffer so much because of my incompetence. It's time to start using the harpoon gun. To be honest, I mostly ignore this weapon because it's weak. It takes quite a few harpoons to kill most foes and after a few shots we have to reload. That takes time and time is in short supply on the water. Plus ammunition is scarce. This stage feels a lot like 40 fathoms. That changes when we get to the theater. We have to pull a switch to get past the curtain? Seriously? You can't just tug it open? It's the most memorable set piece of the stage, but that doesn't say much. Not that this level's terrible. Nothing really sticks out and for me it's just more of the same. I'd like a change of pace at this point, but our journey's not over yet. My only complaint I have up to this day is about a level called THE DECK. <laughs> This has to be the hardest goddamn motherfucking level and it took forever to beat it. Yeah that's right, back then this level gave me the most grief. On our old TV it was so dark that you almost couldn't see a thing. Dude I was talking! Can you at least wait for me to move? Take that punk. Today darkness isn't a problem anymore but you can bet that this is another complex level and as a kid there was no chance in hell I could beat it without grandpa's useful advice. We start on the main deck of the ship and there are several more decks above that we can't access yet. There are many other areas we can explore. A part that I absolutely love is the subterranean lake. There's a raft we can't climb onto for whatever reason. Let's kill some divers and move on. I could have sworn that there are sharks in this lake. Maybe my memory is wrong. It happens. What we have to do is drop onto the raft from above and this fall almost wipes out our entire life bar. Have fun playing a no meds no saves run on this level. I hate forced damage. Pick up the key, jump into the water and I knew it! Not one, not two, but three sharks. Just for fun I'll try killing them with harpoons. It is possible, but I don't know why you would even bother. We make our way to the top deck. I gotta say, I don't find this level to be that complicated anymore, but there is a lot of backtracking if you miss something. Check this out. In Tomb Raider 1 you could sometimes see frozen enemies that weren't triggered yet. Here they appear out of thin air. There, I saw it. 
Damn those flamethrowers! In a shed we finally find the Seraph and are allowed to leave the water levels. I did not expect this, but I think the deck is the best out of these four stages. Even without any kind of supernatural elements, it still has a mysterious vibe to it and making progress feels rewarding. Who would have thought? But my overall feelings towards this whole chapter haven't changed. I have never been a huge fan of these levels and they drag on too long. It's my least favorite part and two levels would have been enough for me. Even more so, I'm happy to finally see something different. In a cutscene we see Lara return to the surface. Back at the oil rig she steals the seaplane. Apparently she can fly planes too. On her way to Tibet the plane runs out of fuel and she crash lands. Did you check the fuel Lara? Luckily she got out of the plane in time. Tibetan foothills is a snow level that has us kill a vulture at the very start. After her classic outfit and the wetsuit she now wears a bomber jacket. Her changing wardrobe would become one of Lara's signatures. What about your legs Lara? Aren't you freezing out there? That reminds me of a politically incorrect German saying. Es gibt nur drei Tiere, die nie frieren. Eisbären, Pinguine und Schlampen. <laughs> I apologize. For that, I apologize too. We can actually jump through this ice wall. I believe it's the only time we have to do that, so it feels out of place. Cool nonetheless. Bartoli's men have also made it here, so it's more gun violence for us. New enemies include leopards, which go down pretty quickly with the automatic pistols. What do we have here? After the boat in Venice, we get to use a snowmobile. A techno song starts playing. It's so different from everything else we have heard so far, but it's badass. Not so badass are the controls for this thing. We have to push up to accelerate and X for turbo. It's such a pain in the ass. Using ramps in particular is irritating, to put it mildly. It takes me a lot of tries to get it just right. Often the vehicle explodes, killing me on the spot. While I love the idea, I dread every moment where precision is involved. Running over people is a delight though. So apparently Lara can float. Is there anything you can't do? There is a key under the ice. We have to trigger an avalanche. Look, there's even a warning sign. Finally, some safety protocols. As we approach the key, a guy on a snowmobile appears. I don't want to be ungrateful or anything, but his ride has machine guns. I want. Don't let him run over you. As cool as the black snowmobile and the accompanying drum music is, it doesn't have the same turbo feature our red vehicle has. That's too bad. Later we run into more of these pricks. I'm not so special after all. Time to talk about the M16. It's awesome. You can't shoot enemies from long range. For close encounters it's not recommended because Lara has to aim and that's clumsy. The best moment is when we jump off a cliff with the snowmobile and it explodes underwater. I have very mixed feelings about Tibetan foothills. In one way it's one of the best levels in Tomb Raider history for me. The setting is appealing, it's light on the cryptic moments and the snowmobile is a nice addition. But man, this has to be the level where I died the most. It gets infuriating after a while. Some deaths were due to my own stupidity, but a lot of times I felt the vehicle controls and the weird physics failed me. It's not as great as I remembered, but there are ways to play the stage without using the snowmobile. So at least there's that. Barkang Monastery is very unique for one specific reason. Not only do we encounter Bartoli's men, but also monks. They all look like Brother Chen Barkang. Whatever you do, don't shoot the monks. Believe it or not, they are on your side and actually help you kill the gunmen. If you accidentally or on purpose shoot just one monk, all of them will know about it and try to kill you with their spears. It's some Zelda Gerudo Temple shit, but one year earlier. That makes the level thousand times harder, so don't do it. Even when you just aim at them, they tell you to back off. And really, do we have to kill everything in sight? I say live and let live. Unless you're associated with Bartoli. Instead, wait for them to carry out the battles. It's completely random who wins. This stage is all about finding 4 keys, 2 gemstones and 5 prayer wheels. It's essentially a big scavenger hunt. The monastery has a shit ton of rooms and areas to explore, but for some reason I never seem to get lost here. The rooms all look different enough and have something new to offer. On this walkway we can see the main hall from above including a giant golden statue. There are tons of traps here including more boulders. The monks really don't like trespassers. This pool has a strong current so watch out. As we fall down a deep pit we enter a tunnel with clamping metal doors. Without flares you wouldn't see shit. 
Those sounds stress me out. Collecting the first prayer wheel turns on the burners, but they are no problem for us. Now we enter the main hall and from here we gain access to most areas. Of course, bad guys show up constantly. Here I accidentally shot a monk without even noticing. Now I know. Sometimes you can see some fools glitching through the wall. The classic Tomb Raider engine at its best. Getting past the swinging spiked balls is not as easy as it looks because your timing has to be perfect. They drain your energy fast. What else have we got? Rolling blades, swinging blades and an outside area where the sound seems to be glitching. Listen to this. Game? Are you feeling well? Apparently not, because all of a sudden it crashed. Good thing I saved a few seconds earlier. I like the doors that look like owls. In general, this level looks incredible. We even get to climb on top of the statue. Not as intriguing as the Sphinx, but still a special moment. Pushing a block in front of the flowing spring drains the pool. Yeah, right. Placing the prayer wheels where they belong opens a giant door. Here we put the Seraph into a gold disc which opens a small entrance. Without a shred of doubt, Barkang Monastery is my personal favorite level of the series up to this point. It has everything I want from a Tomb Raider stage. Great puzzles, hazards and traps that don't rely too much on trial and error, outstanding level design and hanging out with my homeboys make it one of a kind. It's a delight to play and Tomb Raider at its absolute best. Things get a little more serious in Catacombs of the Talion. In a dark cave we must avoid falling icicles. We hear heavy steps. What could it be? An ice T-Rex? Can't see anything. Yet. One way to get enemies to show themselves is to hang from an edge. Just like in the first game they will attack Lara's shadow. The AI is pretty dumb. What is that? I guess I have to go down there. By now I have so much ammo I don't need the pistols anymore. Holy hell, it's a yeti! It was a yeti. So finally something out of the ordinary. There are still leopards and henchmen to deal with. We need to get this mask inside the cage. Except for snowballs and broken tiles above spikes, there isn't much to worry about. Through the pool in the middle which has been drained, we get to the next area. I should have seen that coming. Here more snowballs and leopards await us. There are actually a few spots including the bridge where we can't get to in this level, but there is no way of knowing that. That's a little confusing. With a second mask we can get inside the building. It is pitch black in here and we can hear Yeti scream like idiots. Sounds like there are quite a few of them, but I can't see them. By pulling the switch we open the cages and set them free. As a kid I had huge respect for those beasts. Hearing them and not knowing where they are still makes me nervous. They will kick your ass when you're close enough. I can hear a yeti stomp, but where is he? Why doesn't he come up to me? She's aiming at something. What's up with that? Is he moonwalking on the spot? He can't really get to me. Might as well use the pistols. Wow, what the hell? I can walk through the invisible wall from one side, but from the other side it's a closed gate? This is one weird ass glitch. Avoiding the snowballs will be easy. Ouch. Can I get over there? Nope. If this game had save crystals, I would never try things like that. This way I got nothing to lose. I got so much ammo I might as well just blast fish with my Uzis. Near the end is a puzzle with pressure pads and doors which is fairly easy. Compared to the last couple of levels, this one feels rather short, which I don't mind at all. The yetis are a highlight. I got lost at one part, but overall it's clear what to do and that makes this level a satisfying experience. Ice Palace is the final Tibet level. Shooting the giant bell makes the door open. Creepy music starts playing and we see and hear yetis in a cage. Their screams are intimidating. Look at that fool boxing the air. The beginning is a little bit of a pain in the ass. We have to use springboards to get to higher levels and shoot bells that we wouldn't reach otherwise. That is way more difficult than it looks. If you survive and do it right, it's a fun mechanic. Things get tedious though. Let's watch three yetis punch at my shadow. I could hang here all day. Behind this block is the most cryptic secret of the entire game. How do we get to the dragon on the other side of the room? By walking across an invisible bridge. Nothing weird about that. In addition to yetis we're also up against white tigers. All this killing. In a dark room full of spikes another yeti is lurking around. 
Hey look, now we're on the bridge from the previous level. I like how they are connected, just like the first two Egypt levels in the original game. With the switch we couldn't access before, we can now tilt the fire pot and melt the ice. The tigers are quicker than the leopards. In the water we find a gong hammer. Best to use the harpoon gun while we still can. As soon as we get out of the water, three yetis swarm us. That was close. There's more? That's a lot of snowballs. Ready? Go. Run for your life, Laura! That's a huge gong, man. What's up with the bird creature on it? Good thing we have a gong hammer. This is what we're looking for. The Talion. Let's grab it and leave the level. What's that sound? As soon as we touch the ground, a giant wingless bird on two legs appears. What in the actual hell? I think music would have made this part epic. You can climb back up and shoot it with the M16. That way it's no harm at all and goes down quickly. Pretty anticlimactic. As soon as it's dead, we're done with the Tibet levels. Ice Palace is a great and intense stage with even more yetis and appealing visuals. It's also the first level since the Great Wall without human enemies. Thank you. That that's how I like it. It makes me feel more alone and isolated, almost like a much needed throwback to the first game. I just wish the boss fight had been more exciting. Overall Tibet is my favorite chapter of the game and I never get tired of this setting. Barkang Monastery is the absolute best of the best, but the other three levels are also strong entries. Not even the snowmobiles can take away my enthusiasm for it. A cutscene shows Lara getting out of the caves. She steals a jeep from Bartoli's camp. They follow her and we hear Tomb Raider 1 music in the background. Even Bartoli himself is after us, but Lara manages to escape. This car chase was the most amazing cutscene of the game for me as a kid. Back at the Great Wall she uses the Talion to open the gate we saw at the beginning of the game. I can't wait to see what's next. We're finally here again. Welcome to the Temple of Xi'an. When it comes to the atmosphere, it can't get any better than this. The chamber with the torches in combination with the music makes my skin crawl. There's the dagger. And what do you know, it's a trap. I was so close. We slide down a water slope and fall into a pool. Unless you grab the edge of the waterfall and scuttle to the left to get a secret. Because why wouldn't you do that? This is the last level with water enemies. So kill those carps with all the harpoons left in your inventory. Two tigers are guarding the temple. We can't get in yet. Instead we have to use another springboard. Yay. Other enemies in this level include birds and spiders. Ah! Don't mess with the spiders, man. The background noises are eerie and almost out of this world. Creeps me out in the most positive way. We know this has to be near the end of the game because of the lava. Most games end with fire levels, right? This level must break some kind of record for the most traps. Inside the temple are mechanical warriors, similar to those in Bartoli's hideout. Activating all of them is painful to the ears. Here we have a great platforming section. I wish we had more of those. Next up is the most difficult part of the level, at least for me. Spiked walls are closing in on you. You have to pull a switch and leave through the door on the other side. I have the urge to collect everything I see, so I'm trying to get the medipack too. You have to be absolutely perfect. I died so many times and eventually gave up. I know, I'm disappointed in myself too. I just got sick of seeing Miss Croft die, you know. After that we get more rolling boulders. Well, technically they are metal balls. In another pitch black room we can hear blades, but I can't see them. Yet. Pulling the switch makes a goddamn tiger come out of nowhere, so that's horrifying. The next part with the blades on the ladder is tricky. After that we have more rolling blades and now we're back in the temple but on an upper level. Another timed door has us race against the clock. Oh no, I hate spiked balls. Well what if I hang down on the side and shimmy? I'm smarter than you, game. My idea does work after all, I just didn't do it right the first time. We run over breakable tiles and flee from a metal ball. This is awesome. Ah. This dragon statue is so cool. Just don't jump on its head. The game doesn't know how to handle it. Oh no, more springboards? Up until now I thought the game was quite fair for the most part, but here we have so much trial and error and it starts to get frustrating. 
I save after everything I do. Skipping ahead, we get into a room with a spiked ceiling coming down on us. Even though we have to pull three switches to get out, we have more than enough time for it. I was stuck at the pool puzzle with the current for a while because I didn't see an entrance right away. Hey, we're below the medipack I didn't get earlier. Now the game is just teasing me. There's one more spiky wall, but that's no problem. In the water we find a key and we're back at the temple entrance. Behind the gate we opened is another on the water section that gave me light headaches. Hold on to your seats because now we enter the creepiest part of the game. This is not just any cave. It's a goddamn spider cave. If you thought the spider cave in the first Jack and Daxter game was bad, wait till you see this. The small spiders are nothing to worry about, but what was that? I killed it before I could see it. Sounds awful. Oh my god. This spider is gigantic. Let's check out this enormous egg sac. Whoa! Sweet holy arachnid! This makes me want to throw up. You know, I can deal with yetis, mummies, skinless mutants, but giant spiders? That's where I draw the line. Thankfully, we don't spend too much time here. With the silver key we collected, we gain access to the second temple. If I were to do a no meds, no saves run, this next part would be the one I'd fear the most. You've got a series of springboards on the way to the top. Considering we can barely control our movement once we're in the air, that's not an easy task. In another big room we see two large dragon statues surrounded by lava. This part is quite fun and I only died because I messed up one jump that should be easy. The final part forces us to perform a mid-air somersault in order to grab a ladder. It's a tricky maneuver but so satisfying when done right. A cutscene shows us back at the dagger. Bartoli and some of his cult member buddies got here before us and they perform a ritual to some demonic music. It creeps into your soul. Bartoli plunges the dagger into his heart and his goons carry him out. Lara follows them into a green building. Nice shot by the way. Reminds me of the For Your Eyes Only movie poster. Temple of Xi'an might be the longest level. It took me about 90 minutes. I died so many times and some parts annoyed the hell out of me. Despite all of that, this is my second favorite level after Barkang Monastery. The dark mood really gets to me and there is danger around every corner. I could do with less trial and error, but other than that, it's exactly what I want from a Tomb Raider stage. Simply marvelous. Floating Islands is surreal. Like the name suggests, we are surrounded by green floating islands without any logical explanation. I just know that this is the M16 level for me. Why? You'll see. Pull up the weapon and wait. Do you see something glowing in the distance? With the M16 we can shoot at it. It's a statue that has come to life. A flying warrior with a big sword to be exact. Here we can see one that hasn't been activated yet. This is another one of those stages where even after all these years I can't seem to remember what I have to do. Don't get too close to the warriors with the two spears. They are faster than you'd think. Not even the grenade launcher kills them with one shot. Being pushed off the edge of course means eternally falling to your death. This place looks so abstract and out of this world. It's disorienting to be frank. Two mystic plaques open the gate to the next area with a bridge and a burning rooftop. The roof. The roof, the roof is on fire. Good thing we can hear the flying warriors before we see them. This way I don't get a heart attack. In close encounters with the spear dudes I either use the grenades or the shotgun. The boulders in this level are green. Of course they are. Ah, zip lines. We haven't seen those in a while. What's up with this room? Lava walls? What is this, hell? Well hello Satan. This place looks incredible. There's one part that felt impossible. We have to get past three slashing blades. Because we're knee deep in water we can't walk fast or jump. I just couldn't get the timing right and therefore I died and died and died some more. With luck I eventually made it. But it turns out I didn't have to do that. In fact I got here too early. Normally you'd come from the other side and turn off the blades. Fuck me man, I wasted so much time on this. The roof. Be prepared for more action as we have to kill 4 knife throwing cult pricks and 4 warriors. Don't fall into the lava like I did several times. A climbing section above a spike lava pit follows. For some reason I messed up the turning around mid-air several times. As we enter the next building we finish the level. 
I don't know about this one. Once again, the atmosphere is fantastic and gives you an unsettling feeling. I'm afraid I have to admit that I don't enjoy it. The warriors have never been fun enemies for me. Most importantly, I find navigating through the level tiresome and boring. If I really think about it, it's actually my least favorite stage. I did not expect that. This is it, the moment of truth. The Dragon's Lair is the final level and our chance to take out Bartoli. Not immediately though. First we kill 4 warriors. Since I have like 80 grenades, this is all I'll use. Not even the cult douchebags die from one grenade. What did they have for breakfast? Morphine? One of them has a mystic plaque which opens the door to the final area. We see Bartoli's body lying in the middle of the room. As we approach him, Bartoli turns into a goddamn giant ass fire breathing dragon! Holy shit! The legend was true after all. That thing really impressed me as a kid. T-Rexes are for babies. This is the real deal. Even better than an ice T-Rex. We're talking fire. There are a few ways to deal with this magnificent beast. If he gets you, you're screwed unless you jump into one of the holes that lead to a pool. It's recommended to dive in there anyway because there's lots of ammo down there. Not that I need it, but whatever. My trusty strategy is to stand behind one of the pillars and shoot it from there. For some reason the dragon stays in this one position and just hits the pillar. Once it goes down, you have a short window to pull the dagger out of its heart. If you fail to do it in time, it will stand up again. Pulling it out will kill the dragon, leaving only a skeleton behind. Well, Marco, the dagger is mine now. Only I will not plunge it into my heart. I'm happy the way I am. Nice and intact. The exit opens, but the ceiling starts to collapse and it burns. Burn, motherfucker. Burn. I don't care, let's take a look at how much ammunition and medicine I had left. Damn, that's a lot. Once a litter buck, always a litter buck, I guess. Well, I had to use one more medipack because flames burst out of nowhere. This is the shortest stage by far. It feels more like a continuation of floating islands and I ask myself if it really needed its own level. The fight against the dragon is epic, but I feel like it's missing something. That's right, there's no music. Remember how awesome the encounters with the T-Rex or the Legless Mutant were? The music made these fights so much better, giving the player a burst of adrenaline. It's a missed opportunity in my eyes. Still, it's a worthy finale to a very long adventure. Similar to the Atlantis levels, the China stages ramp up the difficulty significantly. The supernatural elements along with the darker tone make them a satisfying and worthy final stretch of the game. A cutscene shows Lara escaping from an explosion. She wakes up a little later next to the Great Wall. And that's it folks! Wait, what's happening? Lara's home? That's right. Home Sweet Home is a bonus level that takes place in the mansion at night. Lara is sitting on her bed admiring the dagger when all of a sudden the alarm goes off. No, not the alarm from Offshore Rig, thank god. Turns out the thugs from Venice seek revenge on Lara and break into her home. We start with no weapons except the dagger. Well we can't use that or we might accidentally turn a goon into a dragon. I don't want dragons on my property. Remember the door we couldn't open in the training level? Now we have the key and get into her weapon stash. In here we find flares, medipacks, the shotgun and 27 boxes of shotgun shells. Just what you need in an emergency like this. Ever heard of privacy you perv? There is only one goal. Kill every trespasser. Then I suppose she locks their bodies in the freezer. You can explore the entire mansion and garden but there isn't really much to do other than shooting gunmen and dogs with limited ammunition. It should be enough if you don't waste it. With 15 enemies killed one final guy shows up. It's the dude from Opera House with the two big guns. With him dead we get to see the final cutscene. Well hello. Don't you think you've seen enough? With the credits rolling along with some nice images of Lara, we get to hear the techno tune one last time. Home Sweet Home is a sweet bonus and totally unexpected. And that's it. It says here that it took 10 hours and 16 minutes to beat the game. According to my video files, it's more like 13 and a half hours. Dying is time consuming. Like last time, I want to take a few moments and talk about the music and sound. For most of the game, all you hear are the sounds of your own footsteps or weapons. I love the sounds of grenades exploding in the morning and the M16 firing at rapid speed. I'm not a fan of how the pistols and automatic pistols sound. Compared to the first game, they sound dull. 
Worst is the harpoon gun. The voice acting in general is a lot better in my opinion. I specifically like the cutscene with the cult member. Although I've got to say that I find Bartoli and Fabio a little hard to understand sometimes. Hey, it's just a gut feeling that um, maybe. Shelly Blonde wasn't available to provide the voice of Lara, but we still hear her grunts and screams. <sighs> Judith Gibbons took over the role and gave her a more mature tone, which I think is a perfect match. That was gunfire. I think it was them who got taken away by it. I still prefer how she sounds in Tomb Raider 1, but it's very close. I'm sorry. Music plays an even more important role than before. Composer Nathan McCree had more time to create it, and it shows. Not only is there more of it, but it sounds more cinematic. <laughs> It seems like McCree brought more of a big picture approach to the soundtrack this time, while still keeping the instrumentation varied and, at times, complex. A lot of sound clips are very short, but signal the importance of what's ahead, whether it makes us cautious or even run for our life. A piece I have always enjoyed is the one that sometimes plays when Bartoli's minions show up. The ladder tune is beautiful. I just wish it wasn't associated with ladders. The ambient sounds like the echoes, the heartbeats and whatever it is we hear in the Temple of Xi'an improve on the experience we loved so much in the original. While I enjoy some individual songs from the prequel more, the second game has a more well-rounded soundtrack in my opinion. It sounds like Tomb Raider, but still has its own identity. We should honor the best of the best. Here are my top 5 songs from Tomb Raider 2. Number 5 the main theme varies from its predecessor, but it still has that distinct Tomb Raider sound. Although I prefer the first theme song, this one is really beautiful as well. Number 4. This track was the coolest thing in the world when I heard it the first time. It's so different from the rest of the soundtrack and is a product of its time. I think it holds up very well and really like how it incorporates the main theme in the middle. Number 3. This song only plays in case you get on a black snowmobile. All you hear is drums, but it's so awesome. Number 2. The violin piece that plays in Venice is quite simply perfect. I don't think I've ever liked a classical song as much as this one. It's a pleasure to my ears and transports me onto an Italian speedboat on the peaceful canals. Number 1. This is the track that comes to mind first when I think about Tomb Raider 2. I like how it builds up and gives me the feeling that we have made a great discovery. But wait, there still might be danger ahead. Let's wrap this up. Tomb Raider 2 takes everything that made the original great and improved on it. The visuals are superior. Not only do the action-packed cutscenes look smoother, but the in-game graphics have been updated as well. There aren't as many graphical hiccups as before. Due to a better draw distance we can see much more. Dynamic lighting is introduced and notably enhances the experience. This way I can throw flares down a hole and see what's down there. Lara looks more rounded and more like an actual human being. Plus we get a free-flowing ponytail. The human enemies still look clunky, but this is the PlayStation we're talking about here. There's a great variety of animals and other creatures, with the giant eel being especially frightening. Most levels are massive compared to Tomb Raider 1. Due to many outside areas, the game feels a lot more open and less claustrophobic. That can either be a good or a bad thing, depending on your preferences. I like the variety. There is a good mix of light and dark stages, with the Temple of Xi'an being the atmospheric highlight of the series so far. While I think some levels like Oprah House are too complicated for their own good, other complex levels like Barkang Monastery do it just right and make the sense of progression feel rewarding and fun. Plus, you gotta give the game props for starting with a level like the Great Wall. That's a ballsy move to put such a difficult level at the beginning. For returning fans, it's almost like the developers gave us the keys to their brand new car. 
Here, you can drive on your own now. Back then, this was such a difficult game for us and we were dependent on walkthroughs my dad had printed at work. Just like with the first game, it was so much fun to watch my dad play through levels that were too tough for me as an 8 year old child. It's all I wanted to see. The weapons with the exception of the useless harpoon gun are great and I usually stick with the pistol so I have enough ammo for later levels. But I'm never at risk of running out of ammo so on my next playthrough I'll use the other weapons earlier in the game. That's in large part thanks to the secrets, which I think are handled best in this game. Knowing that there are always three secrets feels reassuring. Plus you can always check out in your stats how many you've collected in the current level. This feature was missing in the original. Starting a new game after beating it gives you all weapons and infinite ammo. Although I'm not the biggest fan of the wetsuit, I like how this game started the trend of Lara sporting different outfits for different parts of her adventure. For me the most important thing is that they improved on the controls. Lara plays much more fluidly and turning around isn't such a bitch anymore. I haven't even mentioned that you can roll on the water now. She feels a lot more agile and although the ladders are annoying, it allows for more complex levels. Of the PlayStation games, I think this has the best story. The feeling that you are up against an entire cult is thrilling. Maybe I would prefer this game over the first if it wasn't for one specific aspect. There are way too many human enemies. The best stages don't have humans in them, the one big exception being Barkang Monastery. Here the stage benefits from them because we can see the monks fight back. Other than that it's so repetitive, especially when we get to the oil rig and water levels. It gets better near the end but for most of the adventure they show up all the time and it pulls me out of the game a bit. How can I feel trapped and isolated if there are 30 to 40 goons in a single stage? Even though Peter will hate me for this, I prefer enemies in the form of 32-bit animals. This game clearly has more of an emphasis on action and gunplay. I like that too, but if I had the choice, I prefer the way Tomb Raider 1 handled it. So while Tomb Raider 2 is a better game in many ways, I prefer the overall experience with the original Tomb Raider. That game had a really strong first half and the second half wasn't too shabby either. Here there are too many levels that are good but not great, particularly in the second quarter. It's a long and difficult game so you have to be patient with it and make use of the save feature, which is a godsend by the way. Don't get me wrong, I love the game and I replay it every few years. Both my dad and my brother say that this is their favorite favorite Tomb Raider game and I can totally see why. If you liked the first one, you'll most likely get a kick out of this game too. Newcomers might have problems with the controls, but that's what the training area is for. On PC the graphics are a bit better. Just like the first game, the PC version has an add-on called Golden Mask with 5 additional levels, which I also reviewed in 2011. I could just go on and on about this game. We haven't even talked about the cheats yet. In response to the Nude Raider patch, Core Design made sure to include a nude cheat in this game, which actually makes Lara explode. I'm at loss for words. This is one of the best sequels of its time and it deserves more recognition. As a Tomb Raider fan, it's a must-have title and definitely one of the better entries in the series. Hey everyone, this is G from. Thank you so much for watching my video. Feel free to rate, comment, subscribe, and follow me on social media. I'll see you later. Have a nice day.